Feel the power. Welcome to a Righteous Invasion of Truth with Dr. Abel Damina. Hello, Facebook family and friends. What a joy to be able to welcome you today to this wonderful broadcast. You know, it's always a joy to serve you the grace of God to teach you the word of God. Just before we get into the service of today, I want to also mention, if you're in an area around the world where you're following these teachings and there is no Christ-centered church where you can attend church, two things are very important. Number one, God doesn't want you to be in isolation. The Bible says God sets the solitary in families. You need to belong to a local church, a local fellowship, where you're able to learn with other brethren and beyond learning, where you're able to serve the brethren with the grace of God and the gift of God upon your life. You know, the word of God teaches us against selfishness. When you begin to stay by yourself, you're being selfish. You're denying other brethren the grace of God upon your life. So I want to encourage you to ensure that you are a part of a Christ-centered fellowship. And if there's none in your area, send me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina. Tell me where you are. If you want to host or you want to be the coordinator of the campus, we will train you, equip you, and help you start one in your country, in your community, so you become a lighthouse to the darkness in your community. Very, very important. I'm expecting to hear from you today. And if there is a Christ-centered church, it's good for you to belong there and make a difference. If there's none, we expect to hear from you. Remember also to order for our teaching materials, both the books and the audio teachings, so that you can equip yourself and establish yourself in the light of Christ Jesus. Fasting your seat bells right now as I take you into that service where the spirit of our God is already moving. Happy viewing. We are still looking at the legality and the vitality of salvation. Hebrews chapter 2 verse number 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Lest at any time we should let them sleep. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that had him? Take note of that verse. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. We're going to look at the events that preceded the birth of Jesus. The events that preceded the birth of Jesus because we are working on, you know, the legality and the vitality of salvation. In the synoptics, and when we say the synoptics, we mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the synoptics, what events preceded the incarnation of Jesus? John the Baptist, who is the last prophet, was the person who preceded the birth of Jesus as a prophet. He was the last prophet and he was a prophet actually who was in the prophetic ministry before Jesus was born. There was no change in the pattern. Okay, so how do you identify John? Let's go through the history of this. Matthew chapter 11 verse number 13. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. This is Elijah which was for to come. So Jesus called John the Baptist Elijah. Elijah to come. Look at Matthew chapter 17 verse 10. And his disciples asked him saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias or Elijah must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. And they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the son of man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. The Jews knew that someday somebody will come before the Christ. From the scriptures of course from what they read. The issue is they didn't know he had come. Jesus told them it was John. Where did Jesus see that John was that Elias? He saw it in the scriptures. Which scriptures? Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. Behold, 
I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. I will send a messenger who shall prepare the way before me. Look at Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 to 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with a cause. All right? Now, so Jesus said that Elijah is John. Now, in the synoptics, you will see a drama. And I want us to follow this drama. It's interesting. Luke chapter 1. And before we read, that drama is a man called Zacharias. Who saw an angel and the angel told him, Elizabeth shall bear a son. And you shall call his name John. Luke chapter 1 verse 16 and 17. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So what did the angel come to do? What did the angel come to do? I'd like you to think about that. Then secondly, who said Elijah will come? Malachi. Malachi was a prophet who prophesied the coming of Elijah. And now by explanation, that Elijah was John the Baptist. How did Malachi speak? Malachi spoke as a prophet. He spoke as a prophet. All right? No prophecy, remember, of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's what Brother Peter said. Holy men of God speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So that statement came by the power of God through Malachi. That statement came by the power of God through Malachi. What the angel did was to hearken to the voice of God's word. When the fullness of time came, that angel just came to voice it out. That's all the angel did. The angel just came to voice out what was in the scripture. Because the angel didn't have the power to do what the word said. Because this is Malachi. When Malachi spoke the word... Malachi was not the one. Those words were words spoken of God. So those words did not lack power. Remember Zechariah and Elizabeth. They cooperated with God's power and they received. They cooperated with God's power which is in God's word which is contained in the scriptures of the prophets. You didn't hear that. Elizabeth and Zechariah cooperated with God's word and God's power and God's power is in the scriptures of the prophets. All Zechariah and Elizabeth did was to cooperate and receive. Question, where was that power of God? The power of God is in what the prophets had said. Now, did he require ability to perform it? I mean the angel. No, the angel did not require ability to perform the words. What did it require? The words. It required only human cooperation and human's reception. Have you seen that when it came to John, it was also according to the scriptures. According to the scriptures. Which scriptures? Malachi. Malachi prophesied concerning John. So the reason John was born that way was not because of John. He was born in the prophetic way in which he was born because of Christ. The reason for the messenger was to herald the coming of Christ. How? According to the scriptures. Alright, so he was heralding the coming of Christ. I'm talking about John the Baptist now. According to the scripture. Now look at what John said of himself. John chapter 1 verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. A man sent from God. 
By the mouth of who was this man sent? By the mouth of Malachi the prophet as contained in the scriptures. So even when John was saying there was a man sent from God whose name was John. It's not as if he had a prophecy from somewhere. It was from his study of the scriptures. He saw that Malachi spoke concerning his mission and concerning his assignment. Just like Jesus opened the book and found where it was written in the book. That was the same way John the Baptist also found where the prophet prophesied. And he knew that because the prophet had spoken and it was contained in the scriptures, it will surely come to pass. Look at verse 7 of John chapter 1. Pay attention. The same came for a witness. To bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to be a witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighted every man that cometh into the world. Look at the question that they asked. John chapter 1 verse 23. He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As said the prophet Isaiah. He was quoting from Isaiah 40 verse 3 and Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. That's where he quoted that verse from. Isaiah 40 verse 3 and Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. He said, mine is to show you. Why will you show us? Because it has been spoken. So because it has been spoken of me and my assignment has been declared in the prophecy I have found out that I have a mission sent to point to him. To point to the truth. That is the mission of John. Now, from that drama, what did Elizabeth do? Elizabeth believed. She took the words spoken from the scriptures. You know, that angel that spoke to Elizabeth did nothing. He only spoke what was in the scriptures. So he didn't do anything. Angels have no power of their own. Angels are messengers of the power of God. Angels have no power of their own. Angels are messengers of the power of God. So therefore, they have no power to take, you know, decisions on anything. And the power is in what God said. The power is in what God said. Alright, so all angels do is to hear what God said as written in the scriptures and excel in strength proclaiming it. The strength they excel in is in the strength of the word of God. Angels don't have strength on their own. That is why when believers are filled with God's word and they begin to speak the word of God, they generate an activity of angels. Because angels excel when the word of God is spoken. The moment Satan fell, he lost his power as an angel. Angels only function according to the word of God. Angels only function according to the word of God. We don't send angels as believers. We speak the word of God. And when we speak the word of God, angels excel when they hear the word and they go into action. Psalm 103 verse 20. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength. How? That do his commandments. They do his commandments. They don't do your instructions. They do his commandments. How? By hearkening unto the voice of his word. They hearken unto the voice of his word. So I take the word of God from the scriptures. I put it in my mouth. And I give voice to the word. When I give voice to the word, angels will hear the word from my mouth that is written and excel. Because in hearing the word, the power of God contained in those words energizes the angels for action. They excel in strength, hearkening to the voice. Now the word of God is given voice to by the believer. And when angels hear the scriptures, the scriptures have potency and ability in themselves to cause the angels to excel. That is, their muscles go into activity and they're empowered and energized to carry out 
the will of God as contained within the confines of the scriptures. So in this instance, the angel just rehearsed and said the scriptures. The things we read there are not mere words. They are words that carry power. The things we read in the scriptures are not mere words. They are words that carry power. So as that angel reminded Zechariah, who should know, Zechariah should have said, Oh God, that is it. But let's look at Mary. People believe that Mary said, I miss my period. And the angel said, don't worry. No, that's not what happened. Who did the angel come to? He came to a virgin exposed to a man. Thou shalt conceive. It's not automatic. Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and shall call his name Jesus. The same thing the angel said to Zechariah in Luke chapter 1 verse 31. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. So the angel now is quoting the scriptures. Look at verse 32 of Luke chapter 1. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. 33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Look at verse 34 of the same chapter. Then said Mary unto the angel. How shall this be? Seeing I know not a man. It didn't happen to Mary just because God said. Mary was required to accept what God said so that God's power can go into operation. Because God forces nothing on anybody. He allows men to accept or reject. He does not manipulate. He does not intimidate. He allows men to be willing. Now look at verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And the angel answered and said, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. It's funny how the King James you know, robs us of certain things because of limitation in language. You think that the angel was preaching to Mary. No, the angel wasn't preaching. Better or better translations will put it like this. The angel said to Mary, no word of God shall be void of power. That's what he said. It was not with God. Not No, 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 it's weak. No word of God. He was emphatically telling her, no word of God shall be void of power. That is to say, the ability to bring the word of God to pass is inside the word. The ability to bring it to pass is contained in the word. The angels were referring to what the scriptures have said. So question, what did the scriptures say that gave the angels the audacity to tell Mary, no word of God shall be void of power. Look at what the angel said. They quoted from Isaiah 7 verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So already, whether Mary being pregnant was already written. The power to get her pregnant was already in the scriptures. So all the angels were to do was to announce. And once Mary accepts, those scriptures goes into operation. The moment she accepts. Look at another prophecy. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace. There shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. To order it and to establish with judgment and with justice. From henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. No word of God. Which word? Spoken by the prophets. No word of God shall be void of power. Which word? The word spoken by the prophets. Written in the scriptures. Spoken by the prophets. Now listen. It was spoken so that it will be written. And it was written so that the goalpost never changes. 
It was spoken so that it will be written. No word of God spoken by the prophets is void of power. God did not release power by the angel. God released power when he spoke it by the prophets. God released power when he spoke those words by the prophets. Look at Mary's answer. I love the word of God. Luke chapter 1 verse 38. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel disappeared. So the angel didn't play any part, only to announce. And once she received it, Kabayana, the angel left her with the word to go. The word knows what to do. The word knows what to do. And we, of course, we know that the word became flesh. Now, so please pay attention. According to God's word, written in the scriptures, at that point she said, be it unto me according to thy word. She conceived. Instant. She, that's why it's called incarnation. The miracle happened. Every time a man receives the scriptures by faith, the power of the scriptures are received. God's word carries power. The minute he spoke it by the prophets, the power was in the words that God said. And that power was in the word to bring it to pass from the incarnation. Remember, we saw that the word put Jesus on the cross. We saw that Jesus, by the word, went to the grave. And we saw that Jesus, by the word, rose from the dead. So now, we are seeing that Jesus, by the word, was conceived. Jesus, by the word, was born. So it's not like God was doing new, new things. Uh -uh. In the prophecy, the power to actualize the events was contained in those words. So it was just to find the word, believe the word, and it is done. Matthew 1, 20 to 22. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, that son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord, not by the angel, by the prophet, which was spoken by the Lord, not by the angel, but by the prophets, by the prophets. So the angel did not originate anything. Neither did the prophet originate anything. So question, where did the power, where did it come from? It came from God. The power came from God. The power of God comes with the word of God. The power of God is in the word of God. The power to do what God says is in the word of God. So, the same thing at the incarnation of Jesus. The power of God overshadowed Mary. The incarnation. He said the power of God will overshadow you. That is why I keep saying, Mary actually didn't give birth to Jesus. It was not a birth. Because Mary's blood was not used. Mary's eggs were not used. There was no sperm involved. Mary was a sinner. So her blood didn't touch Jesus. Jesus was sinless. So all Jesus did was to use Mary like a surrogate mother and come out. There was no interference between Mary and Jesus other than he sat inside her like a container. And at the right time, he exited. That's why the Bible says he was born not of flesh nor of blood, but of the will of man. And that is why you don't worship Mary just because she carried Jesus. That's not enough for you to worship her. She too had to be born again. If Mary never got born again, she would have gone to hell. That's why on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 1, Mary was with them in Solomon's porch waiting for the baptism of the Holy Ghost because she too had to believe. That is why a time came when Mary was thinking too much of herself. Jesus told her, woman, stop, 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 stop. I must be about my father's business and you don't know what that father is. He put the record straight for her. And you know, some Christians feel like, well, you know, Mary must be very special. She carried Jesus for nine months. 
What about me? He lives in me forever. Her own was nine months. Me, I am his temple forever. He said, I will abide. I will live in you forever. So nine months and forever, which one? So if you are worshipping Mary, you should be worshipping me too. Because I am carrying Jesus forever. He lives in me. I live in him. We can never be separated. Oh, glory to God. That's why I'm taking time to make you see that what made the issue happen was not because it was Mary or an angel. It was God's power contained in the prophecy of the prophets in the Old Testament. Contained in the prophecy of the prophets in the Old Testament. When it comes to the kingdom of God, Jesus has equalized all of us. No Jew, no Greek. Nobody is superior. Nobody is inferior. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus brings all of us. You know, he equalizes all of us. In Christ, all of us are one and all of us are the same. Now, let me proceed in what I'm dealing with here now. It was spoken by the mouth of the prophet. God had said, when this woman hears the scripture and receives it, the power of God will come upon her. And the angel told her that's what was going to happen. What the prophet spoke was the word of God, which did not lack power. Remember, things happen according to the protocol of scriptures. Things happen according to the protocol of scriptures. There had to be the, you know, the voice of one to cry in the wilderness. John had to come first because things happened in sequence. John was the last of the prophets. And Jesus was not to be revealed until John comes out and prophesied. So all the prophets prophesied until John. So things happened in accordance with the scriptures. The angel did not put Jesus into Mary. I repeat. The angel did not put Jesus into Mary. It was the word that God spoke. The word that God spoke in the scriptures that had the ability. The angel pointed Mary's attention to it. She said, be it unto me according to your word. Which word? Not the word of the angel, but the word of the scripture spoken by the prophets that the angels gave voice to, to Mary. We understand the incarnation. When he said we should enter his rest, he saw those that did not enter. They didn't enter because they didn't mix faith. They didn't mix faith with what they heard. The word of God, they didn't mix faith with it. So the rest of God is not Saturday. The rest of God is God's word. The word of God is the rest of God. His word is his rest. His word is his rest. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. 45. Then opened ye their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So what was he pointing their attention to? That whatever he was doing was in fulfillment of the scriptures. God spoke his word. God came into humanity. Became a man. And his word came to pass. Look at Jesus on the cross. He began to quote Psalm 22. When he identified with man, he went to hell. He said, you will not leave your holy one, see corruption. Or you will not abandon me in hell. You will not allow me or suffer me, see corruption. You will not leave me in hell. Where did Jesus hear those words? He heard it through a prophet. So that means God spoke through a prophet. That he will not leave him in hell. Jesus therefore put the same words. He took the words of the prophets. Put those words in his mouth. Spoke those words. And those words quickened his body. And he rose from the dead. So God did not have to go to hell to raise Jesus. That is why, listen carefully. You will see that in Jesus' resurrection. 
Nobody prayed for him to rise. Nobody. Nobody prayed for Jesus to rise from the dead. Unlike Lazarus, there's a difference between the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of Lazarus. You know, Jesus said to Lazarus, Lazarus, comfort. Elijah raised somebody from the dead. Paul raised somebody. They prayed and laid hands and the person came back to life. In the case of Jesus, his resurrection was according to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Because he came to fulfill the scriptures. How did he do it? He put the scriptures in his mouth. And from the garden of Eden to the cross. He put the scriptures in his mouth. That means the scriptures do not lack power of fulfillment. Now I know when I said from the garden of Eden. He put the scriptures in his mouth. You'll be wondering where in the garden of Eden. After the fall of man. The seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. That was the prophecy of Jesus. So from that prophecy, Jesus took those words. It is written of me, I will bruise the head of the serpent. He spoke those prophecies. He spoke those words. And those words, they are not void of power. As he was speaking them, the power of God went into operation and caused the scriptures to be fulfilled. Jesus said, you know not the scriptures, nor the power of God. Mark 12, 24. And Jesus answering said unto them, Do you not therefore err? Because you know not the scriptures, neither the power of God. You know not the scriptures, nor the power of God. Second Timothy 3, 16. All scriptures are given by inspiration of God and are profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. Inspiration means breath. That the scriptures were breathed on by God. That is the scriptures are God breath. No prophecy of scripture is of any private origin. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So... They were not the words of men. They were the words spoken from the heart of God. They were words spoken from the very heart of God. Those words came from the very heart of God. Now, Jesus took those words, spoke them in Hades, and came up from the dead. It was God that raised him too. Because the words were powered by God. And Jesus, when he took those words and spoke them, God, by his power in those words, raised him up. But he also was the one who spoke them. So he raised himself up. God never entered hell to bring Jesus out. Jesus went to hell with God's powered word in him. And on the third day, he spoke the words and the power of God in the words he spoke Brought him out of the dead. Someone said, but the Bible talk about the Holy Ghost. Now you cannot separate God and his word. And you are trying to say there is the power of God and the word of God. Oh, you can't separate them. The word of God is God's power. God's power is God's word. Is it clear? The word of God is God's power. God's power is God's word. You can't separate them. Meaning God can say something. And be saying what's going to happen. Now, God's word has the inherent ability to bring to pass what God says. God's word has the inherent ability to bring to pass what God says. Look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. And God said, light be. That's the way it is in the original Hebrew. Light be, light was. <laughs> that's the way he did it King James says let there be light as if God was taking permission from somebody no the original says and God said light be light was he just called it light and light responded 
Okay, that's the way it is in the original. Now, we have seen that that statement was speaking symbolically to Moses about salvation. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 to 6. In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Now, let's see this. So when Jesus entered into hell, he was there, spiritually dead. Why? Did he commit sin? No. So why? Because he was made sin. And because he was made sin on our behalf, God placed the judgment of humanity on him. Could he speak the scriptures? Yes. Did he know the scriptures? Yes. Did he forget the scriptures? No. He said, into your hands, I commit my spirit. He wasn't saying, you have my spirit in your hands. Mm -mm. That's not what he was saying. What you are saying is, I commit my spirit into the scriptures. I commit my spirit into the scriptures. Why? He died according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures. He rose according to the scriptures. So when he says, into your hands I commit my spirit, what you are saying is, into the hands of the scriptures, I commit my spirit. So the scriptures must be fulfilled. And Jesus said it cannot be broken. Scriptures cannot be broken. Now, if anybody in hell that day had spoken of the scriptures, he would have come out. Boom. He would have come out. Anyone. Because the authority of Satan had been broken. The minute Jesus hung on the cross, Satan was no more in charge. For example, if you look at the rich man, you know the story of the rich man. What we have seen from the story of the rich man is a disobedient spirit will never change. Mm -mm. A disobedient spirit will never change, not even in hell. Not even in hell. Suffering cannot make a disobedient spirit change. Do you know that when the Bible says, that people in hell are gnashing their teeth. They are not gnashing their teeth because the fire is hot or because they are suffering. They are still gnashing their teeth in anger. They are still rebelling against God. They have no regrets. Mm -mm. Because a man goes to hell deliberately. He sees the gospel. He rejects the gospel. And he goes into hell. That rebellion and that anger against the gospel is what he keeps expressing. That he is suffering in hell doesn't change his resolve. Mm -mm. So the anger. I mean look at the rich man. The problem is not the suffering. It is the fact that he has refused to receive the love of God. A man in hell has refused to receive the love of God. Just like the rich man. He, look at what the rich man was saying. Send somebody to go and tell them about this place. He didn't say send somebody. To go and tell them about the love of God. Uh -uh. The rich man's issue was not the gospel. He didn't care about the gospel. What he was saying is warn them not to come because of the suffering here. Not because he regrets being there. Just to still rebel. Just to still rebel. And Abraham said they have the law and the prophets. He insisted let somebody go and tell them. Meaning nothing changed about the rich man. His rebellion to the word of God on earth was still manifesting even in hell. But do you know, those who were saved came out with Jesus. You know why? Through faith. <laughs> Through faith. They believed. They obtained a good report in Hebrews 11, 1 to 3. 
seeing the things from afar off. They had believed it. And Jesus came in to fulfill what they had believed. So they just cashed in. Nothing changed. What they believed from Abel to the last person in Hebrews 11 was the word that God said. What got Jesus out of the grave was that same word that God said. So from Moses to Joseph to Abraham was what God said. So don't look at the Bible as a mere book. The things said here were inspired of God according to God's redemptive plan. Inspired of God according to God's redemptive plan. How Christ will suffer for our sins. According to the scriptures, how he will be buried, according to the scriptures, how he rose the third day, according to the scriptures. See, they carry the very power of God. If any man will receive those words, he will be saved. So, the power of God is in the scriptures. You didn't hear that. The power of God is in the scriptures. Look at Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son whom he had appointed heir of all things by whom also he made the worlds. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down. He purged our sins. He sat down. Did you observe? When he had by himself. When he had by himself purged. He himself sat down on the right hand of majesty. Do you know that Jesus did it himself and it was in fulfillment of what God has said. Now, let's look at the ministry of the Holy Ghost for a bit. John 16 verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now look at me everybody. He says, because I go away. The going away was death, burial, and resurrection. Then he now says, when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will reprove. The word reprove means he will convince. Three things. Sin, because the world believe not on me. Righteousness, I go, you see me no more. Judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Now look at verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. You cannot bear them now. Three things we read there are concerning Jesus. Sin, righteousness, judgment. The three of them are concerning Jesus. How be it when he... The spirit of truth is come. He will guide you into all the truth. That's the way it is in the original. For he shall not speak of himself. But whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it to you. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So the word sin, John used there, is a word in the Greek that implies something that is corporate or something that is common to all of us. Like a generational thing. Apparently, 
John's reference was the nature of sin. When Jesus said he will reprove the world of sin. Why? Because they believe not on me. Believe not on me as what? Believe not on me as the one who takes away the sin of the world. So the Holy Ghost will point us to the fact that Jesus has taken away the sin of the world. He will also point us to the fact that Jesus is our right standing with God. He will also point us to the fact that Satan is judged. That is the Holy Ghost message. Jesus. The message of the Holy Ghost and the focus of the Holy Ghost is Jesus. Jesus. So when Jesus was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, the Holy Ghost will point you to Jesus. He will point you to the person of Jesus. He will point you to the gospel. How that Jesus died, how that Jesus was buried, and how that Jesus was raised from the dead the third day. So it's in those three events that we see Jesus as our sin, as our righteousness, as the judgment of the prince of this world. Because that punishment was death. So why did Jesus go to hell? He went to hell to pay the price of man's sin. Which was spiritual death. Remember, the wages of sin is death. So those two things. Number one, spiritual death. Number two, those who were spiritually dead went to hell. So Jesus went to hell. Three days. Three days in hell, Jesus brought the whole of eternity. Eternity past, eternity future, and compressed it in three days. That is why out of three days, he gave us eternal life. Out of three days, he gave us eternal redemption. Out of three days, he gave us eternal inheritance. So the three days was all of eternity compressed in three days. All of eternity compressed in three days. So when Jesus rose from the dead, he had paid the price for man's eternal sins once. He paid that price once and for all. And today, 1 John chapter 5 verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begot, loveth him also that is begotten of God. Jesus is the Christ is different from Jesus Christ. They are not the same. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the man. Yes. That Jesus is the man. That man is the savior of man. Is born of God. Hmm. Whosoever believeth not Jesus Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. Now, who is the Christ? Christ will suffer. Christ will die. Christ will be buried. And Christ will rise. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the man, Christ will carry the sins of the world. Christ will be our righteousness. And Christ will be the judgment of the devil. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Glory to God. Whosoever. And that's why the spirit of the Antichrist rejects the humanity of Jesus or the deity of Jesus. Any teaching, any teaching that says Jesus is not a man, that teaching is Antichrist. And any teaching that says Jesus is not God, that teaching is Antichrist. So, Antichrist is not a person. Antichrist is a teaching that denies the humanity and the deity of Jesus. That teaching 
is what John the Revelator in his revelation saw as symbolic 666. 666 is not a number. It's a mode of communicating that Antichrist is a teaching. And that's why John said, Antichrist is even with us now. So Antichrist was with them 2,000 years ago. And it is still here now. It's a teaching. Stop waiting for a man. It is a teaching that denies the humanity of Jesus or the deity of Jesus. I have a six hour teaching on that. The Bible truth about the Antichrist. Stand on your feet. That's all I got for you in this service. Glory to God. And Father, we pray for everybody under the sound of my voice. Revelation knowledge is granted to your people today. Veils fall off. Clarity comes. Holy Ghost. I ask that the revelation of Jesus is teared up in the hearts of men. It grows big on your inside until nothing else matters. Barriers broken. Revelation like never before. Receive in the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise for great grace that is upon this house and upon your people today. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Oh my goodness, what a service, what a word. I believe you've been impacted, affected with the word of his grace. Listen very carefully. It is God's intent for you to continue walking in this light. So I'm going to encourage you to keep following. Remember, every day we're live right here on Facebook and YouTube. Every day, 12 noon GMT plus one. 10 p.m. GMT plus one. If you're in an area around the world where you're following these teachings and there is no Christ-centered church where you can attend church, two things are very important. Number one, God doesn't want you to be in isolation. The Bible says God sets the solitary in families. You need to belong to a local church, a local fellowship where you're able to learn with other brethren and beyond learning where you're able to serve the brethren with the grace of God and the gift of God upon your life. You know, the word of God teaches us against selfishness. When you begin to stay by yourself, you are being selfish. You are denying other brethren the grace of God upon your life. So I want to encourage you to ensure that you are a part of a Christ-centered fellowship. And if there's none in your area, send me a mail today, Dr. Abel Damina. Tell me where you are. If you want to host or you want to be the coordinator of the campus, we will train you, equip you, and help you start one in your country, in your community, so you become a lighthouse to the darkness in your community. Very, very important. I'm expecting to hear from you today. And if there is a Christ-centered church, it's good for you to belong there and make a difference. If there's none, we expect to hear from you. Remember also to order for our teaching materials, both the books and the audio teachings, so that you can equip yourself and establish yourself in the light of Christ Jesus. It's such a joy to be able to serve you the grace of God. My prayer for you is that the eyes of your understanding be flooded with light, that the reality of Christ will resonate in your mind. We rebuke sickness, disease, oppression. We come against whatever is not planted by God in your heart today. We command it rooted out. And Father, we thank you for miracles, healings, and testimonies. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh,